IELTS Speaking Test Part 3, Preparation for 2024. In this video, I'm going to cover how you can prepare for Part 3 of the test. For me, this is the hardest part of the test um, in terms of the difficulty of the questions, but it's also the hardest because it's the least predictable. We, we can know fairly accurately what sort of questions are going to be asked in Part 1 and Part 2 of the test. The problem for part three is that the examiners are given guidance on questions to ask, but not the exact questions. And they're also given freedom to ask their own questions and to follow up on anything that you say. For instance, if, if you use a word and they don't think you understand what it means, they might ask you a question relating to that word to just kind of test. Or if you... Um, Maybe you make a mistake with tense, then they might ask you a couple more questions um, to see if you can use that tense correctly. So how do we prepare for it if we don't know the questions? Well, we, we do have some ideas, and so this is what I'm going to cover today. And the first one I'm going to cover are the topics, and perhaps more specifically, the questions that are likely to come up in part three of your test. This is based on the part two topics and questions. I, I, I made a separate video about this, uh, but I'm gonna cover these today. You want to know the questions you can ask the examiner. This is really important in part three. It's highly likely that you're going to need to ask questions. And also, asking questions is not a bad idea. This part of the test is supposed to be a discussion. That means two ways. And one way uh, to get a discussion going is to ask questions. Um, of course, you don't want to ask inappropriate questions. So I'm going to highlight the questions that you can ask the examiner. I, I want to cover um, filling phrases or, or what I call buying time, some things that you can say if you don't know what to say. Like, I mean, if the examiner asks you a question and you understand it, but you're not sure how to answer it, I'm gonna give you some phrases that you can use so that you're not sitting there in an uncomfortable silence. I'm gonna teach you some useful structures so that you can structure your answer well. This will make it easier for you to answer questions and it'll make it easier for the examiner to understand your, um, what, what, what you've just said. Oftentimes when I'm examining, um, in part, it gets to the end of part three, and I, I, I kind of have this feeling that the um, the candidate's mouth is moving, and I've heard words, I've heard sentences, but they're not really answering my question or the questions that I'm asking. And these structures can make it useful. It's, it's a bit like writing. If if you've seen my writing videos or may, may anybody's, like structures for for essay writing are really important. And I'm going to teach you uh, some useful structures that you can use to uh, answer the examiner's questions in part three of your test. I'll cover uh, strategies, um, ways of answering questions, such as having two main ideas or um, having one very general idea and getting more specific and getting onto an example to illustrate it. It's something we do in essay writing as well. And then I'll get on to common question types in part three of the test. Things like um, what kinds of, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages in the future, in the past, what are the reasons why. We'll have a look at these um, so that you're uh, kind of not blindsided in the test, so that you know what some of the typical questions are, and also so that you're prepared for these, so that you know how to answer these question types. I, I often feel if, if you prepare for these eight question types, you're ready for any of the sort of um, topics and questions that come up because you've got the structures, you've got the language to answer um, any of these types of questions. So let's start with our topics and questions. And following from the way I organize everything for part two, we've, we've got maybe like 30 or so topics in the test. I divide them into five themes, which are uh, people, places, 
things, activities, and experiences, and I organize them thematically. It just makes it a bit easier to deal with the 30-odd questions so that we can have ideas for them, so we can have vocabulary for them. So let's have a look at current part two questions and think about what sort of uh, questions we might expect in part three in the follow-up sort of session. So we've got a bunch of questions about people. For this first one, we should expect questions about, so if you get like you get this topic in part two, then we part three you could expect questions like, um, um, what sort of people are talkative? Uh, what are the advantages of being a talkative person? What are the disadvantages? What types of careers suit talkative people? The, the second one might be a bit more tricky. Um, maybe the questions could be about um, ways people in your country welcome people. Um, what, what are reasons why people are welcoming? Or what are some reasons why some people aren't very uh, welcoming? We should expect some questions about successful people and what makes them successful and maybe what makes people unsuccessful. Questions about sports or sports people. What types of sports people are famous in your country? What types of sports are popular? What are the advantages of being a famous sports person? What are the disadvantages? Sort of some of those questions could be similar to being a celebrity, right? I mean, advantage of being, uh, or let's say a disadvantage of being a famous sports person. Everywhere you go, people bother you. You lose your uh, privacy. People want autographs and those sort of things. So even if you're not into sports, you could probably answer these uh, from a sort of general celebrity type of position. This one may be questions about getting to know people and what are some ways of getting to know people and what are the advantages of knowing your neighbours? What are the disadvantages? It's worth thinking about some of these things. This one might be questions about foreigners. Um, and so foreigners are going to be people who come to your country from overseas. If you go overseas to other countries, you are the foreigner. So just remember that sometimes people get, their, their answers are a little bit muddled or confusing. Um, we might also, or you could expect some questions about languages and advantages of speaking languages and disadvantages. There, there could be disadvantages sometimes about speaking other people's language. You, you can hear their gossip. I, I imagine you're sitting on a bus in another country and they're talking about you, but they think you don't know and maybe they're saying a whole lot of negative things or... I mean, maybe they're saying great things. I mean, normally it's normally it's positive. Normally, when I've been in that situation, it's normally something positive. Most people are nice to foreigners. And that'd be a great question for part three. Why are most people polite to foreigners and blah, blah, blah? I think most people like to be a good host, right? Uh, that sort of comes up to this question about welcoming to your home. Most people like to welcome people to their country and they want to be good ambassadors for their country, right? Uh, places, uh, you better prepare for relaxing places and you can also think about the opposite, uh, places that are not relaxing, that are stressful. Um, parks and maybe national parks and national parks will be good because they can cover this one and maybe this one, places in your country that you're interested in. A lot of candidates struggle with this. I don't know why, but uh, a lot of candidates that come into the test, if, if I ask them about what are some popular places in your country, places that people like to visit, that's, that's a tricky question, is what I often hear. But, I mean, is it? This should be an easy question. But anyway, make sure you know what some of the popular places are and how to talk about them in English. Things. Um, so what are some of the things we should prepare for? Movies, uniforms, that could be tricky. School uniforms, work uniforms, uh, advantages of uniforms, disadvantages of uniforms. Science subject, that could be hard, uh, especially if you're not a science person. Um, so just have a think about that one a bit. What science subjects are popular in your country? It could be computer science. Uh, if, if, like... I'm born in New Zealand. If it's New Zealand, then uh, agricultural 
agricultural science is um, popular, ag science. A lot of people do a BA in ag. Um, so it, it depends on your country, right? And then photo, painting, I, you could sort of prepare these together. You can talk about colors and there's that, uh, there's a color question in part one. So that language could be recycled here. Um, there could be questions about photography and um, what makes a good photographer or painting and what makes a good painting painter and what makes, uh, what, you know, why are some paintings masterpieces and others just garbage and, and those sorts of things. Rules can be quite difficult to talk about. Um, so have a think about that. It could be um, good rules in your country. It could be bad rules about your, in, in your country. It could be why we need rules and what happens if we don't have rules and should the rules be stricter, say like um, should road rules be stricter to reduce accidents? Um, I suppose that's going to be a yes. It'd be hard, hard to answer no. No, I think it's okay if a few people die. I mean, most countries have problems with road deaths and a lot of them seem um, unnecessary or preventable and maybe we need stricter rules. Or, or maybe that just doesn't help. Maybe people know how they should drive, they just don't or um, just things happen. It's quite a lot of activity questions. So what are they? Outdoor activities and what sort of outdoor activities do people in your country like and what are the advantages of doing them? It could be questions about activities at school, great vocabulary, ex extracurricular activities. So we have our curriculum, which is our normal sort of academic subjects and then extra, extra means sort of outside like extraordinary, outside of ordinary, extraordinary. Um, so extracurricular activities are things maybe like swimming, something that's not mandated, it's not a compulsory part of the curriculum. The skill, skill you learned when you're a child, so we could learn about, uh, we could have questions about skills that children need, maybe technical skills, social skills, academic skills and help with study or work, like how to concentrate, how to um, be motivated. Those sort of things could be worth thinking about. Jobs and jobs that people in your country like to do or don't like to do or um, that are useful to society. Noise and what noises irritate people and maybe what sort of noises do people like? Maybe the, the chirping of birds. Do you like to hear birds chirping? Party questions are usually not too difficult. You can talk about um, the people at parties and the places and the activities, the sort of things people do. And a activities that are tiring, um, which could be like exercising, like running. Um, it could be housework. Uh, it, it, it might be activities people enjoy doing and it could come back to your outdoor activities. Those two are quite similar. And it's good to recognize how some of the topics are quite similar and this is why we organize them thematically. Um, as always, there's a lot of questions about experiences and experiences involve feelings and emotions and um, uh, experiences often involve places for them to occur, people that are involved, maybe activities, complaints and what sort of things do people complain about and what's a polite way to uh, complain and why do some people complain more than others? We, we all know people like that or, or maybe that's you, maybe you're the person who complains more than others. Maybe you're complaining about this video, maybe you're the one who wrote that negative comment. Um, I mean, a lot of people tell me in the comments, you speak too fast. And then somebody else, you speak too slowly. So in the end, um, I just speak at the speed I want to. And, um, you know, you can speed up and slow down YouTube videos so you have the control. You can speed it up or slow it down if you want. 
Uh, we should expect some questions about losing things and finding things and what sort of people lose things, you know, careless people. Questions about street markets, and people don't always know what street markets are. Um, think of night markets, and a night market happens at night, so it's one kind of street market. We can also have markets during the day. Uh, sometimes we call them flea markets. Flea markets. Fleas are a small little insect that jumps and makes you scratch, and I, I, I guess flea market because they're a, a flea market's usually second-hand goods, right? And it might have fleas, like if it's bedding or something. I guess it's just a name. It's it's kind of a idiomatic expression. Oh, so good to use the flea market, right? Because it's an idiomatic expression. Um, we've got questions about finishing something quickly and what sort of things do we need to finish quickly and what are some ways to finish things more quickly by being organized, by burning the midnight oil, by um, cooperating. It can help help expedite um, things that you want to get done. It's hard to do everything on our own. Trips and holidays, and this will tie in with places in your country that people like to go to or don't like to go to, and advantages of holidays and disadvantages. Um, possibly some questions about delaying, you know, what, what often causes delays for trips, you know, things like um, planes being delayed or um, other types of transportation, I think. Weather, maybe. Weather and boats. And on the issue of delaying, um, waiting a long time for things and how to kill time and what sort of things do people often wait for in your country. And then this last one could be tricky for young people, a period of time that changed your life. You might not have had a lot of life changing experiences, but you should have had some, maybe like the transition from primary school to high school, or maybe moving house, or uh, maybe changing universities, or changing from living at home to the dorm. Try and stay away from negative things that might make you feel upset in the test, such as um, uh, people passing away. I mean, that can be life changing, but it's not really. Great for the test, right? All right, so we've spent quite a lot of time on the topics and questions. I wasn't intending that, but I hope that part of the video is useful. Let's move on now. Let's talk about the um, questions you can ask the examiner. So these first questions you can answer, you can ask in any part of the test. Um, the first one's a mistake. Uh, I, I often hear this one. It's, it sounds terrible. Sorry, can you pardon? It's, it's not the way to ask the question. What, what you do with that is you turn a problem into a worse situation. The examiner is going to have negative body language, like, what the heck are you talking about? It's going to make both of you uncomfortable. Make sure you can ask questions correctly, and then um, uh, it, it, it's not a negative unless you do it too often, right? So I've got some long versions and short versions. So. Let's imagine you didn't pick up the question. You could say something like, can you please repeat the question? Any, any part of the test, right? Or if you want to ask a longer version of the question, which sometimes is useful, uh, just allows you to think a bit and pause a bit. Uh, and, and you could, so it's a longer question. You could even speak it out a little bit slowly. That would be all right. So it could be something like, um, Oh, sorry, um, I, I didn't hear the question clearly. Can you please repeat the question? Or, or even better, use an idiomatic expression. Sorry, I didn't catch the question. Could you please repeat it more slowly? Um, the more slowly could be useful if the examiner is speaking quickly. Sometimes the examiner speaks quickly, and it's not a great idea to tell them that. You speak too quickly. That's kind of like... A, uh, attacking the examiner, it, it'll make the examiner defensive. The examiner will think, no, I speak normally, you listen too slowly. So don't say that, um, but you could say, um, could you please repeat it more slowly? And so you're implying that the examiner is speaking quickly without actually sort of um, attacking them for it. It's, uh, 
It's subtle. Now, if you don't know the meaning of a word, you can ask. There's no penalty for this. And it, it could even sometimes be just the um, pronunciation of the examiner, you know, like British English versus UK English. Sometimes this occurs. So how to ask the question? Sorry, I don't know the meaning of neighbors. Can you please explain the word? You're allowed to do that in any part of the test. It's not having a negative consequence on your score unless you're doing it excessively. Now, for part three, we have some questions that can only be used in this part of the test, and that's because it is more difficult, right? So maybe you understand the question, but, um, or, no, sorry, you, you hear every word in the question, but all the words together don't make sense. So you can say, can you please rephrase the question? So this is asking the examiner to say the same question in a different way, not to just repeat it, because if they just repeat it, it's not going to help because you got all the words, it just doesn't make sense, right? Um, and another thing that I think candidates don't do enough is ask a checking question. Maybe you want to just check you understood the question before you answer it. This is fine to do in part three only. So maybe the examiner says something like, should we always greet our neighbors? And you say, do you mean should we always be friendly to our neighbors? And then the examiner can either say, yeah, that's what I mean, and you know, because it's close enough, or they could say, no, no, I, I, I don't necessarily mean friendly, I just mean, should we just acknowledge them and say hello, with, without necessarily being friendly. <coughs> You know, because being friendly could involve a bit more than just saying um, hello. It could be like, um, hey, why don't you come over to my house for dinner or, you know, whatever. Um, let me help you with your groceries. Um, so being friendly could be considered stronger than just saying hello. Fillers or buying time. So fillers are words like, um, well, actually. Um, they, they can be useful, and what I mean by buying time is uh, buying yourself some time to think before answering a question, either to avoid a nasty silence or uh, just so that you can formulate a slightly better answer. So here's some phrases that we can use. We're, like part three is useful to have a phrase like, we've got the word well, it's not going to buy you much time. So we could say something like, let me see, that's a tricky question, right? So we're saying that we've got a nice idiomatic expression in there, tricky question, and while we're saying that, we can be thinking about how we're going to actually answer the question. We could have something a bit longer. Oh gosh, I'm really not sure about that, but probably it is. Then we can have some idiomatic expressions, and you can also think of these as um, kind of sort of introductory phrases that you might use to start your answer. They have high level language in, in them, they're idiomatic expressions. They're going to help your vocabulary, which is really useful in part three, because the questions are difficult in part three. You might be struggling just to answer them, um, and as a consequence, you might not be using a whole lot of high level language. So here's some. Um, and let me explain them. The first thing that springs to mind, it, it's like the first thing I can think of, the first thing that springs to mind, off the top of my head, it's, it's just without thinking too much. I'm, I'm answering your question, but I'm not thinking about it too much. This is just what comes off the top of my head. Gosh, that's a tricky question. So you're telling the examiner that uh, you're finding the question difficult, and, you know, you might have a bit of a pause before and after that. You might sort of, I'll, I'll give you the, the full version, including body language. Mm, gosh, that's a tricky question. I'd have to say that. So here's a thing. Um, oftentimes when a tricky question does get asked, the candidate feels nervous. And because of the nervousness, the um, adrenaline rush occurs and the candidate ends up speaking faster than normal. 
So they're speaking faster than normal, which puts them under more pressure than normal because now they're speaking faster, so their, their mouth has to keep up with their brain, but their brain is struggling. So um, when you get a tricky question, slow things down and, and use a phrase like this, slow everything down, don't speed things up. You can speed up when you feel confident, that's the right time. And when things are tricky, slow down. Structures can be really useful to answer questions. Um, it's a bit like the writing test. If you have a structure, it can make it easier for you to respond to a question. It can also make it easier for the examiner to understand your answer. So having a really good structure is a good idea. Let's, let's look at one possible structure. This is similar to an essay, a paragraph in an essay. Imagine you're writing a problem solution essay and the question is, um, what problems does fast food cause? So we could have two main ideas, right? We could have um, weight gain because of the calories and maybe poor health due to some uh, unhealthy ingredients such as fat and sugar and salt and um, chemicals even. And then uh, when we come to answer the question, we can have an introduction, just like a topic sentence in an essay. So it'd be something like, well, I think there are two main problems that fast food is causing. And, and then we can introduce point one. Perhaps the main one is uh, obesity. You know, there's a lot of calories usually in fast food. And so this is leading to growing obesity in society. Then we want to introduce our second point. Another negative aspect of fast food, junk food, is that it's often harmful to our bodies. You know, it contains a lot of fat and oil and even some toxic chemicals. Then you might possibly do a summary where you pull together the two main ideas that you just gave to the examiner. So I think the main negatives of fast food are the obesity that it causes and also the negative impact that it's having on people's health. Now, what I'm going to do for the rest of the video is go over um, th these last three things. I'm going to talk some more about the structures that you can use in this part of the test. I'm going to talk about some strategies like having two main ideas like you just saw then or uh, maybe one idea um, obesity and then uh, get more specific and maybe even example so obesity and then talk about calories and then talk about um, uh, maybe how many calories are in a Big Mac and make it up if you have to or something um, or just all the, the, the particularly sugary products like uh, like I've heard, like a can of Coke has something like, I don't know, six teaspoons of sugar in, sugar in it or something. I mean, that's, that's terrible, right? Of course you're going to gain weight if you drink Coca-Cola. And I want to talk about question types that come up in the test. Uh, I think there's eight of them that I've identified. So things like, um, what sort of fast food do people eat in your country? What are the advantages, disadvantages of fast food? Uh, what are some reasons why people eat it? Similar to the advantages, but not always. There are some advantages of fast food, right? It's you can get it quickly. You can uh, it usually tastes okay. It doesn't taste fantastic, but it doesn't taste terrible, right? So there are some advantages to it as well. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. No one would buy it, right? I mean, the marketing is one reason, but it's not that good, is it? These are the eight most common questions in part three of the test. You'll see these in more detail later on, but let's just quickly run through them. One, different kinds of. Two, comparing. Three, predicting. Four, advantages. Five, disadvantages. Six, solutions. Seven, reasons. Eight, opinion. To answer questions in part three of the IELTS speaking test, we can use a structure that resembles a burger. We can think of the buns as being an introduction 
and summary or conclusion to our answer. Then we have our main ideas represented by the meat, cheese, tomato and lettuce. Let's look at these each in a bit more detail. First we can introduce our answer. We can do this by paraphrasing the question. Then we can move on to our first main point and develop this point. Then we can introduce our second main point and develop that. We could even introduce a third main idea. Finally, we might want to summarise our answer. Let's look at a sample question so we can see how to apply our burger to real questions. We're starting with our first question type, which asks about different kinds of. This is often the first question in your part three. The question is, what are some different kinds of places to go shopping? We can start with an introduction that paraphrases key words from our question. Well, there are a wide range of places to go shopping. Then we can introduce our first type and develop it. One of the most popular types is department stores. I think this is because they stock high quality products and always offer a money back warranty if you're unsatisfied with your purchase. Then we can introduce our second idea and develop that. Another trendy place that people in my country enjoy shopping is at night markets. I guess this might be because it's a lot of fun and the prices are usually cheaper than in the stores. Now we can summarise or conclude our answer. So department stores and night markets are the most common. You'll notice that some of the wording is highlighted in bold. This is structural language that you can use for other similar questions that are asking about different kinds of. Let's imagine that the question is asking about different kinds of places where we can go to relax. We can use that same language and then just change the development a bit. We could start with an introduction like, well, there are a wide range of places where people can relax. Then we could introduce the most popular type. One of the most popular types is cinemas. Or we could still keep it department stores if we wanted. So you can use this language that's placed in bold to build your own model answers to questions asking this function about different kinds of. Let's move on to the second question type about comparing or making comparisons between two things. The question is, what are the differences between what men and women shop for? In answering this, I'm going to give an introduction, a main idea, a second idea, then I'm going to finish. I'm not giving a summary for this question. You don't need to give a summary for every question. I feel my answer is long enough without it, so I'm going to stop after I've developed my second idea. Again, you'll notice that some of the words are in bold. This is the structural language that you can use for any question asking you to compare two things. We start with an introduction that paraphrase, paraphrases key words from the question. Well, obviously, there are a number of clear differences. 
Then we move on to the first main idea. Perhaps the most significant one would be that men tend to be more interested in shopping for electronic gadgets, whereas women have a preference to shop for makeup and clothes. Then we move on to our second idea. In addition, a subsequent contrast could be that women like to shop in expensive malls, while men prefer to shop in small retail shops. Our third question type, predicting, or the future. The question is, will shopping be different in the future? We start with our introduction. It is difficult to predict the future, but I think there are going to be some major changes with regard to shopping. Note that sentence. That sentence could be used to answer any question about the future. If you can memorize phrases like this, it will make it easier for you to answer questions. This is because your brain won't have to think so hard. You'll have most of the sentence already. You've only got to complete the end of the sentence with the question specific words, which in this case is shopping. Then we move on to our first main idea. I'm not exactly sure what will happen, but one possibility is the popularity of shopping online may lead to people only shopping from their apartments. Then we move on to our second point. This second point is a little less likely to happen, so we use some slightly different language for this one. Furthermore, this might sound a bit crazy, but I think one day we may even have robots who can go out and buy the things we need. Our next question type asks about advantages of something. The question is, what are the advantages of shopping online? We start with a sentence that introduces advantages. Clearly, there are a number of obvious merits. Then we introduce our first one. But I would probably say that the one thing that really stands out is that it is convenient. This is obviously favourable because we all lead such busy lives. I just want to point out here too that stands out is an idiomatic phrase. So part of this phrase that you can memorise for this type of questions involves an idiomatic expression, stands out. Then if we look back at our introduction, Note the way advantages has been rephrased into merits. So by learning some of these answers, it'll help your fluency and it'll also help your score for vocabulary because you're showing the ability to rephrase advantages to merits and you're also using an idiomatic expression, stands out. Let's look at our second point. Besides this, a second positive point could be that we can save money. This is because the prices of e-commerce sites are cheaper than physical stores. If the examiner asks you a question about advantages, it's very likely that the next question will ask you about disadvantages. Our question is, what are the disadvantages of shopping online? We start by introducing our answer. For sure, there are some drawbacks. Point one, I suppose the most difficult aspect might be that we can't see the actual products we are purchasing. 
And this can be irritating because sometimes the products don't meet our expectations. For instance, shoes might not fit. Second idea. At the same time, another stumbling block with shopping online is that it is not always safe. The issue is that sometimes a company might take our money and not deliver us the right products. And note we've got another idiomatic expression embedded in here, stumbling block. A stumbling block is like an obstacle or a barrier, something that prevents something. So while we're learning language that we can use for any question about disadvantages, we're also injecting some high-level language into our answer. The next question type, solutions, requires you to give solutions to a problem or a disadvantage. The question is, how can we make shopping online safer? Note in the introduction how I use the word tackle instead of solve. Tackle is an idiomatic expression. Let's see our answer. I believe there are a few ways to tackle this problem. Perhaps the most effective solution is for governments to regulate online retailers. Consequently, only reputable and reliable companies will be able to sell online. In addition, if schools were to educate young people about the need for caution when shopping, it would result in an increased awareness of the need to be careful when shopping online. Therefore, solving this issue requires action from the government and the education system. Note how there's a summary or concluding statement for this answer. The next question type asks you about reasons. The question is, why do people shop online? In answering this question, I have only used one main idea. It could be that you'll only have one idea for some questions. In this case, it's a good idea to include an introduction and a summary. This will help to make your answer a bit longer. Let's see the answer to this question. Well, I think the main factor to account for this is the convenience. You know, you can just surf from the comfort of your home and then the goods get delivered to your home. You can shop without even leaving your home. Thus, I believe it's because it's so convenient. Opinion questions are also extremely common in your IELTS test. Let's look at the question. Do you think most people enjoy shopping? The structure of my answer is to start by clearly stating my opinion. Then I give the main reason for it, another reason for it, and then I have a concession or a contradictory statement. You may not need to do this in your test, but I just want to show you how to do it in case you do. Finally, I end with a concluding statement. Let's take a closer look at my answer. Yes, I do. The main reason is because it is exciting to see new products and gadgets in the store. As well as this, it is often a social activity that we do with our friends. However, in some cases, it can be unpleasant. For instance, if it is too crowded and noisy in the place that you are shopping. 
Therefore, it seems to me that it is usually a pleasurable experience. To summarise this presentation, there are eight main types of questions that you should prepare for in part three of the test. They are different kinds of, comparing, predicting, advantages, disadvantages, solutions, reasons and opinions. You may not get all of these types of questions on your test, but you should be prepared. You can prepare for these types of questions by reviewing my model answers. Take note of the language that's in bold, because that language can be used for lots of different types of questions. Okay, so I hope you found the video useful. What I'll do is I'll put some uh, I'll put some links in the description of the video to help you with certain things. I've got a PDF that you can download to help you to prepare for the test. I'll put some other links for the speaking test that you might find useful. And a final thing, if you now feel ready to take your test or if you're about to take a test, you might like to have a mock speaking test. This is like a one-on-one -on -one simulation of a real test and the benefit of taking this is you can be familiar with the test and what happens and the procedures that happen in the test. You can get more comfortable having a speaking test so that when you go to your real test, you, you don't feel nervous, you know what's going to happen. And also, I'll give you feedback with a score and also some suggestions about how you can improve your score, which I think is the most important part, right? You want to maximize your score. And oftentimes I give people a mock test and I find out that they're doing something not ideal that's going to have a negative consequence on their score. It could be um, answering questions too short, like yes, no, usually, um, or not enough high level language or some kind of uh, pronunciation error. So oftentimes I can, I can correct things and that could maybe have a half band effect on score. And then oftentimes I can give suggestions. I, I can give suggestions about what sort of language you can use in your test to increase your score or strategies for speaking at length so that you're not always giving short answers. So if you're interested in having a mock speaking test, I'll put a link uh, in the description. The, the mock test will either get done by me or one of my colleagues. I have a few uh, colleagues that are ex examiners that help me with the mock speaking tests. And then finally, just best of luck with your test. I hope that um, you're going to prepare well for your test and that when you take your test, you're going to feel comfortable and things are going to go well. You're going to get the score you need and then hopefully you move on to something more exciting in 2024. All right, so best of luck with everything. Uh, uh, best of luck for everything that you do in 2024.